Well, will you please remain standing as we come to our scripture reading for our sermon today? It comes from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. And we've just sung about these great truths, and now we're going to read about them here from Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. So brothers and sisters, hear God's word. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. Well, will you join with me in prayer? Father in heaven, we do come before you through your Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, and we ask for your help now. We ask that You would be honored and glorified. May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be pleasing to you in your sight. Help us to receive your word rightly and respond in faith and obedience. And we pray this in the powerful name of your son. Amen. Amen. Well, my wife reminded me of a scene from the book Pilgrim's Progress that I think is very relevant to the book of Hebrews. And it goes like this. On his journey to the celestial city, Christian came to the top of the hill and saw two men running to meet him. The name of one was Timorous and the other Mistrust, to whom Christian said, Sirs, what's the matter? You run the wrong way. Timorous answered that they were going to the city of Zion and had got up to that difficult place, but said, The further we go, the more danger we meet with. Wherefore, we turned and are going back again. Then Christian said, you make me afraid, but where shall I fly to be safe? If I go back to mine own country, that is prepared for fire and brimstone, and I shall certainly perish there. If I can get to the celestial city, I am sure to be in safety there. I must venture. I will yet go forward. So mistrust and timorous ran down the hill, and Christian went on his way. This dilemma at the top of a hill, that's right where these original hearers found themselves. Continue on or turn back? They're asking questions that we all too often ask ourselves. Is it worth it? Is it better? You see, they faced threats of persecution. They were tempted to turn back to the synagogue and leave Jesus because that seemed safer. Like last week, Pastor Moody reminded us, we're not necessarily as the church tempted to go back to something and leave Jesus, but we're tempted to leave Jesus and go on to something that is new, something in front of us. And so our author in the book of Hebrews is writing to remind us this, Jesus is better, so stick with him. He writes to encourage God's people to endure all the way to the end. In the section that we are studying this summer, what I just read out, we're going to be diving into it, and it's intended to provide fuel for the Christian church to endure to the end. And I'm just going to focus in on verses 19 and 20, and in those verses, it talks about the confidence we have in Jesus to continue on for Jesus. This confidence that because of who Jesus is and what he has done, we can actually continue on for him. But we're in Hebrews, and Hebrews uses some language that is not always easily accessible to us. It can sound foreign. It can sound a little strange. But put up against the backdrop of the rest of the Bible, our verses come through with powerful force. So for a moment, I want us just to hear some biblical threads that will actually provide hopefully some relevance for us as we read and as we study this morning. So think about the bookends of the Bible. 
Genesis 1 and 2, and Revelation 21 and 22. We have a consistent picture in the bookends of our Bible. It's a picture of God dwelling with his people. They are there with him, they're enjoying his very presence. God's intention is to gather a people who will enjoy the blessing of life with him for all eternity. Unhindered access, incomparable joy. This is the goal that God has for us, enjoying the blessing of life in his presence. But the beginning of the Bible, it talks about in Genesis 3 that humanity rebelled against God, sin enters in, and humanity is now full of guilt before God, leading to shame and fear before God, leading to humanity being sent out from God, separated from his very presence from intimate access, enjoying life with God, to now cut off from God, no access, sitting under the curse and penalty of sin. The bookends of the Bible show this goal God has, but the beginning of the Bible shows the problem that we have. We are separated from the presence of God on our own because God is perfectly holy and pure and just and good and God cannot be in the presence of sin. But because of who God is, God initiated a plan to save sinners so that they could again dwell in his presence. Along the way, God gives commands to his people Israel to build the tabernacle. This was a symbolic house for God. This was a symbol of God's presence with his people because he wanted to what? He wanted to dwell with them. He wanted to be with them. He wanted to meet with them and minister to them. So this tabernacle had an outer court and then it had this first section and then right in the middle of it, it had the most holy place, the holy of holies. And in this place, it symbolized God's presence with his people. But the question remains, how can a holy God be in the presence of a sinful people? This is where God commands sacrifices to be offered and to be made for sin. So we're in the book of Hebrews. Just turn one chapter back to chapter nine in verse six because it's bringing us into this story, reminding us of the day of atonement, these particular commands and sacrifices that God commanded the people of Israel. Hebrews 9, 6 says this, the priests regularly go into the first section, performing their ritual duties. But into the second, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year. And not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. Later on in 10 verse one, talks about how the law is but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of the realities. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. God's goal for us to enjoy life in his presence. Sin separates us from God. God gives the tabernacle as a symbol of his presence with his people, but one priest had access once a year into the most holy place. A curtain separated the people from God's presence. Distance. And these sacrifices offered were offered year after year because they could not truly deal with sin and take away sin. They were ultimately just a shadow of what would come. It didn't provide access to God. It didn't take away sins. And so here is the core issue. These Christians in Hebrews chapter 10 is they were tempted to turn away from God's ultimate provision, the true provision of access into his presence and the provision of forgiveness of sins and to turn back to the shadow which ultimately could not deal with their sin or take away their guilt or provide forgiveness. So the author here is reminding them and reminding us of the only means that God's people can have true access and confidently draw near to him. So as we go through just these two verses here, we're gonna think through three things. It's just a, a who, a what, and a how. 
a who, what, and how. So first, starting in verse 19, who is the author speaking to? What does he say? He addresses them as brothers, meaning brothers and sisters. His exhortation here is not just an individual exhortation. It's to the church family. Last year was one of great isolation. That was added to our tendency of radical individualism. But the Bible gives us a vision and gives us language that we must embrace again. Brothers and sisters in Christ. We need a renewed vision. We need renewed vocabulary of the church as a family. We need to think about one another as family. Talk to one another as family. Treat one another as family. And as we'll study later on this summer, we need to commit to one another as family. Looking back over the last year, I wonder how many late night thoughts or conversations within the life of this church would have been different had we simply thought brothers, sisters, family. COVID has isolated us from the church family. American individualism tries to cut us loose from the church family, but we're here today as brothers and sisters in Christ to hear this word collectively and to respond together, better together. So first, who? The church family. But second, what? Brothers and sisters at College Church, what is it that we have that will help us to continue on and endure in following Jesus together? Verse 19 states it very clearly for us. Since we have confidence to enter the holy places. The holy places here, it's not not this earthly copy, the tabernacle that we were just talking about. The holy places referenced here is the heavenly place where God actually dwells. We have access into the very throne room, the heavenly throne room of God. Access to the living God. We're in current possession of that. Confidence to enter God's presence. Complete access to God. It's like we've been given an all-access pass into the very presence of God. Technology has made watching the NFL on TV very, very enjoyable. But the truth is, there's nothing like actually watching a game at the stadium. It's just not the same. If you have a ticket, you get in. But even so, if you have a ticket, you still can't choose any seat you want, and there's no way you're getting down to the field. That's only for players and the team. And there's security that's guarding all of the entry points. No access to the field for fans. My wife recalls getting invited to an NFL game uh, by a friend whose dad was a coach. She arrived and she was handed an all access pass. Not simply to a seat in the stadium, but it gave her access all the way down to the field. Incredible. And she doesn't even like football. (laughs) And the author of Hebrews is here telling us is that we've been given this all access pass, a VIP pass into the very presence of God. But there's a massive difference. See, my wife was on the sidelines as simply an observer. She did not participate. Our all access pass into God's presence is to participate fully and completely enjoy life with God, not to be an observer. We experience the fullness of joy, the fullness of life that we were created created for, unhindered access, full privileges, complete confidence, without fear of being turned away or rejected. Adam and Eve, complete access to no access. The people of Israel, one priest, once a year, entering into the most holy place. There was still distance. Christians, all people, all access, complete confidence to enter without fear of punishment and experiencing fellowship and intimacy, enjoying God's presence where he will do what? Where he will meet with us and minister to us. This is what the church has. We're in possession of it, this boldness and confidence. 
and we need not fear removal. Church family, God doesn't just want us to do something for Him. He does call us into His service. That is true. But too often, we devote ourselves to getting stuff done for God while neglecting enjoying life with God. We have confidence to enter into God's presence. He's opened up this new and living way. What does it mean that it's a new and living way? It's, it's new and living because it's the new covenant way. This way to life eternal with God. That way had not been opened before, but now it has been opened into life with God, now and into eternity. So who? The church family. What has the church family Receive. What do we have? Confident access before the living God. But thirdly, how? How do we have this access? Well, our confident access is because of the completed sacrifice of Jesus. By his blood, our text says, we enter God's presence. Our all access pass is because of his all sufficient sacrifice, his blood for us. But why such a big fuss over blood? For someone who maybe didn't grow up in Christianity, they might hear this constant talk or singing or prayers about the blood of Jesus, but what is the big deal about blood? Well, there's a pastor named Anthony Carter, and he put it this way. He says, blood is the life-giving and life-maintaining fluid that circulates through the body. The average person's blood is approximately 8% of their body weight. The average person has four to five liters of blood. One out of every seven people entering a hospital needs blood. One pint of blood can save three lives. Here's an undeniable and important fact. Blood gives and maintains lives. He goes on to say that Genesis 9, 4 says that we're told that life is in the blood. If life is in the blood and the blood represents life, then the loss or shedding of blood represents death. So the shedding of animal blood in the Old Testament is a picture here of substitution. The animal was killed symbolizing the punishment for sins which was death. This was in the place of a sinner who would be spared and then live. But truly, as our author says in chapter 10, these sacrifices were offered year after year after year and ultimately could not take away sins. They could not remove guilt. They could not provide access to God. They were only a shadow of what would come. Look at verse 11 of chapter 10. It says, every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And what's the result, verse 17? God will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. No more. The blood of Jesus his death on the cross in the place for sinners, a substitute for sinners deserving death and yet sparing them and giving them life. His blood is the only sufficient sacrifice to deal with sin that separates us from God. His blood is the only sacrifice that cleanses our consciences from our guilt so that we no longer fear rejection before God, but we can have confidence to actually enter in before Him and before His throne. His resurrection secures this living way into life eternal with the living God. And he goes even further, describing that under the old covenant there was this this curtain that the high priest would walk into the very presence of God, but it also symbolized this separation or inaccessibility to God. But the gospels describe that as Jesus died upon the cross, that curtain was torn in two, symbolizing now this access into God's presence. And so in poetic language here, we read that the body of Jesus, namely his sacrifice, has become the curtain through which we enter into God's presence. His sacrifice leads to our entrance. His sacrifice is our only way. 
I wonder this morning, what are you relying on for your access, confident access, before God? Because we live in a performance culture. There's pressure to achieve much. I wonder if you look at your life, you look at what you have achieved, you look at what you have earned, you look at what you have, you say, doesn't that earn me just a little something with God? Doesn't that just deserve just a little bit with Him? The Bible is clear, there's no entitlement with God. There's no entrance with Him on our own. We contribute nothing but our sin, which in fact separates us from Him. There's no other way into his presence, no access except for the blood of Jesus. Our culture is screaming a world of tolerance and inclusivity and pluralism. Choose your own way to God. Brothers and sisters, all other ways fall short. No other way deals with sin. No other way provides entrance before the living God. What can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing can for sin atone, not of good that I have done. This is all my hope and peace. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What is the only way to have access to a living God? The blood of Jesus Christ. We rely on his work, his sufficient sacrifice. It is enough, and there is no other way. And if that's true, we ask ourselves, where do we look for assurance with God? Are there days when you sit with guilt because of the presence of sin, wondering if you're truly forgiven and welcomed into God's presence, if you truly belong there? In those times, we're so often tempted to look to others and compare ourselves to them. That leads to either a false sense of confidence that we have or a complete lack of confidence as we compare ourselves to others. Or we might turn and look to our religious activity, thinking about all the things that we have done for God and in this checklist for Him. Again, leading to a false sense of confidence in these things or a complete lack of confidence because we are not measuring up. Pastor Greg Gilbert writes this and kind of thinking about this struggle that many people think that, yeah, Jesus may have gotten us here, we think, but now we need to prove that we belong, to try to prove and make up for past failures. Our text blows up that way of thinking completely. What gives us access before God? Confident access, the blood of Jesus. What gives us assurance before God? It is not looking to others to compare ourselves to see where we stand. It's not looking to our religious activity and what we have done to try to give us a sense of confidence. It is looking to Christ and His blood for us alone. By trusting in Jesus, He moves us from guilty to forgiven from fear before God to freedom with God, from separation to complete access. Church family, this is what we have, and it's by the blood of Jesus, so that we could enjoy the blessing of life with Him. So we're called to utilize this all-access pass, where all our sins are forgiven through the all-sufficient sacrifice of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we utilize this, we get to experience the loving and merciful and gracious and powerful presence of God where He wants to minister to us and meet us so that we might know Him. He welcomes us through the blood of His Son so that you this morning can know full forgiveness, so that your conscience can be cleansed, so that you can know life everlasting. Well, as we close, I I was thinking about the show ER 
that was on TV for, for many years, kind of following this hospital that was supposed to be based in Chicago. And there's all stories every, every show, but there's this one scene in one of the, the shows where there's a man who's dying with cancer and he's scared about life after death. He's wrecked with past guilt because of what he has done and how he's lived and he's sitting there meeting with a hospital chaplain and he says, how can I even hope for forgiveness? Is atonement even possible? The chaplain basically responds and says that he can, he can really choose his own way with God, but the man stops the chaplain right there and says this, I don't have time for this now. I want a real chaplain who believes in a real God. I need answers. Someone who will look me in the eye and tell me how to find forgiveness because I am running out of time. He's full of guilt, looking for forgiveness, wondering if he can be accepted before God. What would you say to this man if you were sitting at his hospital bed? What do you think the author of Hebrews would say to this man? I think he'd say something along these lines. Yes, sin sin separates you from God. God cannot be in the presence of sin. But Jesus offered a sacrifice for you that truly deals with your sin. Jesus died to provide real forgiveness. He rose again to make a new and living way into the very presence of God. Your fear of being separated from God and from his presence can be turned into confident access and to enjoy him for all eternity. And how does that happen? It's because of the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus will allow you to enter God's presence. But his all-sufficient sacrifice pays for all of your sins and gives you an all-access pass into God's presence when you trust in Jesus by faith. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. College Church, this is our hope. This is our confidence. This is our assurance. Our confidence in Jesus stirring us up so that we can continue on for him, enduring all the way to the end. So may we, today, this week, confidently come to him by the completed sacrifice of Christ alone. Brothers and sisters, let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you that you did send Christ. We thank you that you long for us to be with you in your presence, experiencing the life that you give And we know that we can enter in, into your presence through the blood of Jesus Christ. So we trust in that. That is our assurance. That is our access pass. So we love you and we thank you for your kindness to us in him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.